Elon Musk has a brain chip, mm -hmm. which I guess U.S. Re regulators just rejected in terms of the actual testing of it. Are you familiar with this uh, technology? Mm -hmm. Is there a similarity to what Elon is doing, what you're doing? Uh, there's multiple ways to look at the brain. You can do non-invasive, you can do invasive. We chose non-invasive. Right. Uh, it would be, a, we could use the technology on more people. Uh, so yeah, it's just a different technological uh, path. Okay, here's, you actually have to drill in your skull. Right, and... yeah, there's surgery required. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, it, it has its purposes. Like you, you can do things with implanted technology you can't do with non-invasive technology. Right, and because, uh, I mean, with Elon's technology, someone who is a quadriplegic could actually control, like, a robot arms and legs, right? I mean, so, think of, yeah, think of it this way. So we have roughly 100 billion neurons in our brain. It, it's amazing. Yeah, I know. It's a huge <laughs> Just, number. I'm like, it, wow, okay. It's spectacular. <laughs> yeah. And so if you're choosing, you're trying to look at what's happening in the brain. Uh, with our technology, we're saying... We want to look at uh, basically the neurons across the entire brain and about 15 to 20 millimeters deep. So it's just the cortex. We're not looking at deeper structures of the brain. So we get some percentage of the 100 billion neurons, mm -hmm. but we get a whole mapping of the entire cortex. Uh -huh. Now, if you, uh, but it's, it's a kind of a, a more uh, generalized look at these neurons, not specific. Whereas if you have a chip, you can put a chip you know, in the brain, uh, these electrodes in the brain, and you can get as close to a neuron or a few neurons. But in doing that, you may be speaking to 1,000 neurons, 100,000 neurons. So you choose that versus 100 billion. And you can do a certain thing with that number of neurons. So when you get when someone gets a Parkinson's implant to ameliorate these symptoms, they're getting an implant at a hyper-specific location that does exactly that thing. You're not doing whole brain work. And so it, you're choosing your modality based upon your objective. And so Colonel's objective was measure everyone's brain on planet Earth so we have this awareness. But there's a trade-off you get you know, like in doing the different technologies. Gotcha. Okay. And you also started OS Fund, which you invested $100 million into. Yes. So basically you took your, the money you made from selling your company and half of it, you invested into your own projects. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in OS Fund, what do you think was the big, biggest success you've had in terms of your investments? Uh, we've had several successes. The, the idea behind it was uh, the human race has done a really wonderful job in terms of uh, programming zeros and ones software. When a problem comes up in the world where humans can sit at a keyboard and type away software, humans create great solutions. And millions upon millions of people have that skill set. If we have a problem in the world where we say the coral reef needs to be uh, more tolerant of higher acidic conditions in the water, or like take your problem with like a physical reality, we don't have millions and millions of people who just spin up and can design new versions of Coral Reef that fast. So I was basically trying to invest in an infrastructure to say, okay, world, we've done a really wonderful job learning how to program zeros and ones in software. We really need to now program atoms and molecules and organisms. And so some of my companies, they do things like that. For example, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks uh, for the production of rose oil, instead of planting a rose plant, watering it, fertilizing it, harvesting, and then extracting the oil, they just take a yeast organism, program the yeast, and it produces rose oil. And so you don't have to play with this old school way of going out and planting and fertilizing. It's just done biologically. And you can produce all kinds of things that way. So it's moving manufacturing of all of our essential things to the world of biology. And so same thing with my other companies doing things in nanotech. They build these structures atom by atom. And so it was really uh, making our physical world predictably engineerable hmm. because we need to engineer all things from drugs to materials to everything we do you've got this physical component i mean not to say it's the same technology but can you compare it somewhat to like lab grown meat like instead of you know raising a cow yep. feeding it for whatever five ten years and then killing it and eating it you could create you could take the you know, the building blocks of that meat and kind of create meat in a lab without actually having to create the cow. Yes. Same kind of thing. Same thing. And like, you know, like why, why grow a tree, cut it up and then build a house? Why not just uh, have biology grow the house? Right. I mean, it's, so it's- um, or, it, or create the wood. Yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 it used for the house. Grow yeah. into the house. 
Like actually, the oh, actually, program oh, wow. to actually. Oh, I see what you're saying. Program to grow well, a Not house. even build. Yeah, you just skip the wood part. You could actually grow the house grow itself. House. Yeah. And so it's a mind bending change of how it we is. do things today. Yeah. And these companies have proven the ability to do these things. So, I mean, this is not sci fi. They're doing exactly these things right now in all these different forms. And so our ability, uh, the human race's ability to master the predictable engineering of biology is an unbelievable demarcation of intelligence for us as a species. And it opens up all this, this huge frontier of possibility for us. Between Kernel and OS Fund, have some of these projects been profitable? Or at this point, are you just sinking money in and hoping at some future time that it'll come back tenfold? Yeah, uh, Kernel is still on its way. OS Fund, we've had several companies exit and make money. So, hmm. yeah. Nice. Okay, so you're, you know, running this big fund, you're CEO of Kernel. And at what point do you really start saying, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start working on the whole anti-aging thing? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I've been ruminating on this problem again for a decade, right? Like what matters in the year 2,500? So like if we do a thought experiment and we say, okay, let's go out to, let's go out uh, to low earth orbit. Let you and I look back at planet earth. So it's quiet. And we say we want to quiet all the noise. Everything that doesn't matter, let's just push aside. What is really going on on planet Earth? And I'd say there's three things. One is you've got the emergence of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's just a um, – it's the most spectacular thing happening on planet Earth. Number two is we have this open question, is our biosphere going to be able to sustain us on planet Earth? Important question. Global warming and such. Yeah. And number three is – hey, we as a species, we seem to have kind of a hair trigger on violence towards each other. We're kind of playing around with nukes. Like, like you know, like as a species, we're pretty violent. Yeah. And we're always on the razor's edge of destroying each other. True. So I'd say, like, I'd say those are three things in my mind. Of like, okay. big things going on. Like, okay, so what could we potentially do? And my thought on this is that um, artificial intelligence is moving very quickly. We as humans, for the first time, we don't know our role in the future. We can't map out that we're that we continue to be top of the food chain. Uh, it's just uncertain what's going to happen. We're evolving in this in this place, and we also don't want the fun to stop. Like we like, I mean, I like living. I want to continue to exist. I don't want us to destroy each other. So, blueprint is not. It, yes, it's about anti aging and health and wellness, but really, it's this question about what is the future of being human. And that's what I set out to, to do. And what I basically have shown is I've built an algorithm that takes better care of me than I can myself. Okay. And I guess you got the idea when you were flying your plane and you put an autopilot? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a few layers here. Like one, uh, from a personal standpoint, when I was building Braintree Venmo, I had the stress of being a startup entrepreneur, three little babies at house, a challenging relationship, leaving the Mormon church and chronically depressed. Like that's a lot. And then- I would do really well all day. 7 p.m. would arrive. I'd be stressed out of my mind, ruminating on all the things going on, the fires I had to put out and all that. And I would try to soothe myself by eating food. So I would gorge myself and I was 60 pounds heavier than I am now. And no matter what I did, I could not stop my behavior. I would try every single day. I couldn't do it. And so I just had this weird situation of like, I really don't want to do this, but I can't stop it. Like I'm just powerless. I can't stop myself. And it was this really weird situation. And then uh, one day I playfully, I was so tired of it because I would overeat, then I would sleep poorly. I'd feel, that I'd feel awful the next day. I'd look awful. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I felt so ashamed. Uh, I, I said one day, okay, evening, Brian, you're fired. Like, <laughs> you're done. Like, you are absolutely ruining my life. I hate you. You're just awful. And uh, I gave him a name. I wrote down when he showed up, what his arguments were. Very clever. Like, Brian, just today, like, just one more bite. Just, we'll start tomorrow. You deserve it. You worked really hard. Like, whatever his clever arguments were, and he would try to persuade me, and I just said no. Like, from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., you do not have authority at all to exist to make decisions. And it was the first time I wrestled control of, like, this different version of myself. And I realized that I am hundreds of kinds of Brian's. I'm morning Brian, and afternoon Brian, and after workout Brian, and therapy Brian. And so that was one. And then when I was flying the airplane, yeah, I, I learned how to fly airplanes. And I was one day flying with my hands and I was like doing left, right, up, down and like doing this thing, trying to keep it. And then I put autopilot on and the plane just you know, stood right up, like just perfect posture. I thought, damn, like that's what I need. I need an autopilot for myself. 
you know, like instead of me trying to do this crazy thing all the time. And that's when it just like kind of got in my mind. I thought, um, I want an algorithm that takes care of me because one, I'm pr I've proven that I can't take care of myself the way I want to. And two is I bet it could do a lot better job than I can myself and it could probably improve me. And so then if we say, okay, so uh, another thought experiment, you and I are talking and we say, what is the potential of artificial intelligence over the next 20 years? We're going like, to have a couple ideas, but it's basically better. Neither one of us is going to argue it's going to be worse. Well, if you're Elon Musk, you argue that it's going to be worse, but yeah, I well, think it's going to be better. <laughs> uh, it, he, he's not arguing it's worse. Well, he's scared of AI. Because it's better. Yeah, but it could also, he feels it could also be catastrophic. Okay, when I say better, it's going to be more capable. Yeah. So we're not going to argue whether, whether or not it's going to be more capable. Yeah. We may argue what it means, but it, it's just getting better. Correct. If we say for you and me, uh, are you, what are you and I going to be like in 20 years? We don't assume better at all. We assume worse. We just assume what's our decay curve going to be like, fast or slow? Mm -hmm. What if that wasn't the case? What if we could assume, just like our technology, that we will be better? Humans have never been able to think about themselves like that in the history of the human race. We've never. We've always assumed inevitable decay, decline, and death. Yeah, after a certain age. Right, because you, you would say that, you know, from being from five years old to 10 years old, your body is now more powerful, it's more resilient, and, you know, it gets to a certain point, in which case it goes into decline. But yeah, at our age, I'm 49, you're 40 something. Yeah, we're assuming that every year is going to get, you know, my eyesight's getting a little worse, my glasses have to be improved and everything else like that. And I know, and it was my personal journey, uh, you know, at the start of the pandemic, I was 30 pounds heavier. And I was always thinking, okay, I should lose weight. I should work out. I tried being a, a vegan, whatever else, and never really caught. But then when I realized that the death rate from COVID was tied to obesity mm -hmm. and weight, mm -hmm. that to me was my wake-up mm -hmm. call. Yeah. I said, okay, if I don't lose weight, I might die if I catch COVID. So what I realized at that point is like, okay, it's really based on the amount of calories that I eat. I got this app called My Fitness Pal, mm -hmm. and I started just logging in my calories of every single thing I ate for the first time in my life. And it was like an eye-opening experience. I'm like, oh, okay, so if I hit 2,000 calories a day, according to this app, I will lose weight. And the weight just started flying mm -hmm. off. Yeah, It it was it completely blew my mind. Numbers. And yeah. to this day, I'm still down to 30 pounds. I don't use the app to to count my calories anymore because I understood I, I have a ballpark now of like okay I know this sandwich is about this much this drink is about this much I can sort of eyeball it in my head and that was to me my biohacking experience yeah, yeah. for myself but you took it <laughs> 10, 10 <laughs> steps further than that so what did you start doing for your biohacking yeah uh, so I guess the one one philosophical thought then the practical stuff. So let's just say we, again, we move to the year 2,500 and whatever form of intelligence exists then is looking at 2020, early 2020s. And they're like, amazing that humans did blank that changed everything about the future of the human race. Mm -hmm. What would that be? And I would hypothesize it's potentially humans in the early 2020s figured out how to get themselves, not, their not just their technology, themselves on the improvement curve. That when we imagined ourselves, it wasn't even a 10 year old is going to say, I know I'm going to get bigger and stronger than, but I'm also going to follow the same decay curve. I'm going to die. Humans figured out how to make themselves better so they could begin having aspirations to say, What am I going to be when I grow younger? I don't know what kind of superhero, but I'm going to be blank. The biggest revolution that could happen to the human race would be that, that we switch. And so with, with me, um, I wanted to pursue in an experiment, what would the future of a human existence be like? So if an algorithm really did run my life, what would it be like? And so we started with all the best science. And so I have a team of 30 doctors. We looked at every single lifespan and health span study in, in existence. We looked at all the evidence, we ranked all of them. And then we started going through the systematic process of identifying what would a perfect protocol be like? And that's what we've done. And so every single calorie I eat, every supplement I take, everything I do is based upon evidence. And it's different from today where uh, health and wellness is a lot like religion where you've got an endless number of gurus to pick from, but then it's very hard to know who to listen to. Just like 
the King James Bible supports 100 different denominations, <laughs> when they all claim that they're, they're God's true and only, the kind of is the same as true with health and wellness. Everyone has their own little thing. Right. And we just said, no human opinion. It's evidence and data. And so I became, uh, I think I'm the most measured person in human history. Uh, I have more data collected about myself, and we match up to the evidence, and we create this closed loop system of continual improvement. And I've made the whole thing available for free for everybody. So people can try it. They can they can do it themselves. They can test to see if it works. Okay. So you got 30 different doctors that started to work with yeah, you. Yeah. To, to clarify that, uh, like, for example, I have a medical-grade ultrasound machine at my house. And... Uh, so ultrasound, people are familiar looking at babies in the womb. Mm -hmm. So we do whole body ultrasound. We look at all my joints, all my organs, lung, hearts, brain, all that kind of stuff. And so we have one sonographer who runs the machine, who looks at my heart, one that specializes in my other organs, one that specializes in my musculoskeletal. So when I say a team of 30, it includes practitioners like sonographers who run these machines. 